Praise the Lord. Good to be here this morning. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 8. Um, we're going to move our way uh, into chapter 9. And um, boy, do I have a lot of notes on that. That is not a joke either. I've got a bunch of them. Uh, let's see here. Okay, all right. Yeah, Revelation chapter 8. Um, in verse 10, let's start there. Um, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. We talked about that, at the, the nature of the star. I, I believe it was an angel. I believe it was a, it was a spirit that fell from heaven. And we know that that's possible. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So we know that that's, we know that these stars, these evil spirits can fall. And this one does. Um, the third angel sounded and there, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood. Now, well, my mind is racing 100 miles an hour today. But I, I just had this thought, um, connecting it with things that I know um, that have gone on in this world in the 20th and 21st centuries and is still going on. Uh, the name of the star is called Wormwood. And this star, when it crashes, when it falls, something in it, corrupts um, the waters. Um, the third part of the waters became wormwood. In other words, they became poisonous. They became bitter. Now, uh, pardon me if I share with you a theory on this. You all know it's no secret that um, I research and have research and I have believed for um, most of my life that there are real things that we refer to as UFOs, unidentified flying objects. They are of a spirit nature. That is what they are. Um, and there's something about this one when it crashes to the earth um, it corrupts a third of the water supply on the earth and many men died. Now, um, I'm not going to ask anybody here if you've ever seen a UFO. Most of you probably have not ever seen one. Okay? Maybe some of you have. And I'm going to I want you to hold on to that thought when we get into this morning's message. No, I'm not going to preach necessarily on UFOs, but I believe, well, I'm going to wait. I'm, going to, I'm just going to wait. Not going to give it out now. You're going to have to stay for church, okay? It's got to be put in the con right context, all right? But anyway, it makes the waters become wormwood. Now, what we were doing, we were going through the scriptures and we were finding out what this wormwood was about, why God sent this particular angel to fall on the earth, uh, why the waters became wormwood, what's associated with wormwood, bitterness, uh, gall, things like that. In other words, the water became so bitter that it, uh, they could not drink it. Remember... When the Israelites uh, had just crossed, I think it was, they had just crossed the Red Sea and they got to the waters of Meribah. You remember that story? And the waters were bitter and they could not drink. And so Israel complained to God like they always did. They complained to God and said, God, you brought us out here to kill us, right? You couldn't let the Egyptians do it. You brought us out here all the way to kill us. And God told Moses, Moses, show him what I can do. And that's when Moses took his rod and struck the rock. The first time he struck the rock, he was commanded to strike the rock. And water came gushing out of that rock. 
Uh, the second time Moses did that, he was instructed to speak to the rock and he didn't do it. In anger, he, he struck the rock again with his rod. And because of that disobedience, God would not allow him to be the one leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so we've dealt with various issues of that. I do want you to turn to uh, Jeremiah and because right after we read this, we're going to be in Lamentations and there's something here I want to share with you. Starting Jeremiah 23, verse 11. Uh, for both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, uh, saith the Lord. One of the, one of the last straws with me that, you know, the last straw that broke the camel's back. One of the last issues that really set me over the edge to say to myself, my family, and to this church, I don't think we need to be part of this denomination anymore because we sent our young people to a youth conference. They would always hold it at Windermere, which is a Southern Baptist camp, and it's down at Lake of the Ozarks. And the denomination hired in this nat nationally known speaker of the youth. He is, he is uh, the mouthpiece of God toward the youth of America, and he's got great things to say. He's going to change the world with these young people. And in the course of his teaching, he's talking about how there's not enough missionaries um, to go out into the field. And, you know, we need God to raise up missionaries. And he said there's several reasons for there not being enough missionaries. One of them is most people in the church don't give a blank. And he, he said the D word. Yes! And when our group came back and the man that took him down there told me what happened. I'm going, we're never going to go back to that again. And what happened, what he said after that was, he said, here's your problem. He's, he's pontificating over everybody. He's telling everybody what everybody's doing wrong. Here's what your problem is. Your problem is that you worry more about me saying that I don't give or you don't give a blank then you worry about not enough missionaries to go out on the field. And I'm like, that doesn't justify why you said what you said and what amounted to the congregation of the Lord. And when you look at that verse, 23, Jeremiah 23, 11, for both prophet and priest are profane. He used profanity in his message and wonders why anybody would have a problem with it. And I'm going to be honest with you, that is being done more and more and more now. Okay? Uh, they are profane, yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria, which is the northern, the capital of the ten northern tribes. They prophesied in Baal. Now let me explain what that means. Let me give you New Testament terms of what that means. They preached based upon seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what it means to prophesy in Baal. Baal, as a spirit, gave them the words to speak. And that's where they got their sermons and their messages and their words from. They got them from Baal. I'll give you an example of that. Um, Jehoshaphat was working on being in league with Ahab. Ahab said, uh, there's an army coming after us tomorrow. Boy, I sure would like you, Jehoshaphat, and your armies to help us out in this. And Jehoshaphat said, well, I, I would do this, but I want to hear from the Lord. Ahab said, I got exactly that. 
and he called up these 400 prophets and they all basically said the same thing. You're going to prevail tomorrow. You're going to win the battle. Everything's going to be fine and dandy. You got nothing to worry about. One guy took two pieces of iron and he fashioned them into horns and he said, this is you tomorrow, Ahab. You're going to use these horns like iron and you're going to thrust back all of your enemies. Jehoshaphat's going, wow, that sounds really uh, impressive. Hmm, lying signs and wonders. Don't you have somebody else here that can give me the word of the Lord? Ahab said, I've got this one, Micaiah, but I don't like him. He's one of them King James only guys. And he never preaches what I want to hear. It's what he said. So Joshua said, let me hear from him. So they brought Micaiah out. And Micaiah said, I saw the Lord surrounded by all of these angels and these spirits. And the Lord said, whom shall I send to persuade Ahab? to go to battle the next day. One angel said this, one angel said that. Finally, the, the kid in the back, the angel in the back is going, oh, 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 I know, I know, I know. And God picked on him. He said, what would you do? He said, I will go and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all 400 of the prophets. And God said, you got the job. And that one spirit influenced 400 prophets to prophesy the same thing. And all of it was to get Ahab to go out to the battle the next day because God was going to fulfill the prophecy that he gave through Elijah that uh, in the place where they hung Naboth for not giving his vineyard to King Ahab, Elijah said, that's where the dogs are going to lick up your blood, Ahab. And sure enough, the next day, Ahab is in his chariot. He gets hit by a dart, a spear, maybe an arrow, something like that. And he tells his driver, hurry up, get me out of here. Well, Ahab died in that chariot. And a man took water and started washing out all that blood from Ahab. And sure enough, here come the dogs. And it was in the exact spot where they hung Naboth. God was 100% right on that. But Micaiah was one out of 401 prophets that spoke to Ahab. And because the 400 said, you're going to prevail tomorrow. It was a lying spirit in them that was saying that, inspiring them to say that. Okay, but it was not the word of the Lord. Um, this year, when we go to Kenya... Um, I have it in my mind to uh, instruct and train the pastors to not follow after Kenya's full of them. These false prophets, false teachers, one of them is named Dr. Owar. I've done a couple of videos on him. I'm sure he's heard about it by now. Uh, but he believes he can raise people from the dead and, and uh, he can stop the sun and the moon from, I mean, he makes all these stupid claims and, uh, he's just as corrupt as they come. And some of these guys have been influenced by him. And I know this because some of them have gone to, uh, Michael in the past and said, you know, we used to think, uh, Dr. Awar was some man of God. We're finding out now he's not. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to stick with whatever the Bible says. That's what we're going to preach. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's what's happening here. Um, they, uh, let's see, I will bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation. For I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem and horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. That means they're reading books from the Christian bookstore. They're watching podcasts online. Uh, they're, they're buying, buying sermons from publishing companies who print up pre-written sermons for these guys. And all they have to do is be the talking head who delivers the sermon, which means they don't have to study for it. It's already right there written out for them. 
Um, they commit adultery, they walk in lies, they strengthen also the hands of the evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and of the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets. Now this, to me, this means that this trumpet, the fourth trumpet that sounds, um, is going to have an influence on all of the false teachers, false prophets, uh, false pastors, false Bibles, you name it. If there is a lie that's said in the name of God, this prophecy, this fourth trumpet is for them. Because he says, verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. That's what God said he would do. Same word, wormwood. And make them drink the water of gall. For the prophets of Jerusalem is, or for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you that make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. And again, how hard is it to discern whether or not some teacher, preacher, pastor, evangelist, bishop, whoever, how easy is it now to discern whether or not he's telling you the truth or he's telling you a lie? It's easy. If what he said is in the Bible, he's dead on. If what he said does not come from the scriptures, doesn't resemble anything coming from the scriptures, doesn't sound like anything coming from the scriptures, and contradicts things that are in the scriptures. God said, you don't listen to them. They're false prophets, and I'm going to feed them wormwood. Uh, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, ye shall have peace. And isn't that what that one prophet who made the horns... Every time, every time I see that picture in my mind, I see him holding up two pieces of iron that looks like deer horns and he's got a little red nose on here. Like Rudolph. I do, I'm not kidding you. Whenever I picture this guy in my mind, he's got a red nose going beep, beep, like that. <sighs> Get rid of me, okay? Um... Verse 17, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And that's what they told Ahab, you're going to have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Um, you remember uh, Brother Ron Dagonia? Uh, he, I think he preached this here. Um, before he was pastoring, he was uh, being called by different churches to preach for him. One church in this county um, was between pastors, and so they asked uh, Brother Ron if he would do, uh, if he would fill the pulpit for him. And he said, "Sure, I'd love to." He knew a lot of the people that went to that church uh, because they they all went to a different church together, and now they're part of this church, and they're asking him to come fill the pulpit. During the course of the message, Ron just comes right out with it. Homosexuality is a sin. It's an abomination in the eyes of God, along with fornication, along with adultery. And I mean, he just brings it out in black and white. When he got done, one lady in particular, and she had a bunch of other people behind her, say to him, I can't believe you preach that here. How dare you have the nerve to preach that here? And what it was, was her son was a sodomite. And a worship leader. And because her son had turned himself over to this, she had decided 
that God still was saving him, that he was still born again, and that there was nothing wrong with how he lived his life. And I mean, she jumped the man of God over that. And I commend any pastor who will stand up in front of his congregation, even if he knows they've got family members that are sodomites, and preach against it. My heart is for them. Uh, but here's first, here, uh, turn to Lamentations now. I love the last part of this passage here. Lamentations is an interesting book to me. I won't go into all the details, but it has a, it has a numerical pattern to it. 22 verses, 22 verses, 66 verses, and then 22 verses and 22 verses, five chapters. And it has that outline to it. All the, I said I wouldn't get into it, so I'm not going to. But anyway, Lamentations is the middle chapter. It's like the, it's like the beam of the cross that's being set down in the ground. It has the most verses in it, which is 66. And I believe that Lamentations 3, uh, starting with verse 14, I believe that that is a prophecy concerning the Antichrist and what state he is in now. In verse 14, imagine it just, if you would, that this is the Antichrist speaking. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He, God, hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Uh, remember, there's two types of drunkenness. Physical drunkenness, spiritual drunkenness. Spiritual drunkenness is by far worse than physical drunkenness. And I'm not approving physical drunkenness at all. But it's far, far worse than, than physical drunkenness. Um, he's made me drunken with wormwood. Remember I told you at the beginning of this that wormwood, uh, the other name for it was, David? Absinthe. And uh, which is a liqueur, a bitter. And uh, supposedly it has hallucinogenic prophecies. People hallucinate. Uh, when they drink it. For he made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Don't think that the Antichrist will change his mind when he gets here and say, you know what, I, I want to follow Jesus now. Not going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, that's just my theory. Okay. Then he says, um, verse 19, remembering mine affliction, my misery, the wormwood, he says it again, and the gall. And he is full of that, full of wormwood full of gall. He's in a drunken state all the time. Verse 20, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Now, let's change scenes now. This then is us. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. How about saying amen to that? God, and, I, and think about this for a long time. How many times could God have killed you while you were still in your sins? Numerous. But he didn't do it, did he? What he did for you was have mercy on you because his mercy endureth forever. So he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
because his compassions fail not. God still so loves the world, doesn't he? Now look at verse 23. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And so you woke up this morning. And you may have, and I did this this morning, just don't know, I just did it. I woke up this morning, sat on the edge of the bed. And the Lord just put, I guess the Lord just put it in my mind and heart. Mike, this verse was in my mind. Mike, say thank you to me. Because it's of my mercies that you're even up out of your bed today. If you make it to church, you get to teach your people. That's my mercies on you. And whatever happened yesterday is yesterday and it's gone. So my mercies now are new every morning. Isn't that something? So if you just blew it yesterday, today's a different day. Call on the name of the Lord, confess your sins. God is faithful and just. He will still forgive your sins. Yes, ma'am. Cain. Yeah. Okay. No, that's okay. It's a good question because I would not have known how to answer that had I not came across a passage when David was asking God, God, can I build the temple? And God said, David, I see you've already gathered a lot of the, the wood and everything else, the materials needed for it, but your hands are bloody. Uh, my calling on your life was not to build my house. My calling on your life was to defeat the enemies of Israel. So think of that's the first coming of Christ. He, the first time he came was not to build his house. First time he came was to put down our enemies. Amen. And he did a good job, didn't he? They're put down now. So Solomon then is picture of Christ's second coming. In his second coming, he will pitch his own tent, his own tabernacle. He will build his own temple. Now, what God said to David in that passage was, um, he's talking about his son that comes from his loins. This is typical, or the, the foreshadow of it is Solomon. The fulfillment of it is Christ. And God said, I will be his father and he shall be my son. So in that you see with Solomon, it's the doctrine of the adoption of the saints. God adopts them into his family. In Christ, Christ need, needs not to be adopted. He is by nature the son of God. Okay? So God said to, to David... Um, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit any transgressions or iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of men. But my mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. So Saul started out, if you remember, the day that he was anointed to be king, he's preaching with the other prophets prophesying in the, in the Lord. The Holy Spirit's on him and he's preaching everywhere. But this deal where he was supposed to go in and kill the king and kill the people and kill all their sheep and kill everything that had life in it. And Saul didn't do that. He kept the king alive. He kept the sheep claiming that he was going to use it for a great sacrifice unto God. And, and that's where we get to obey is better than sacrifice. And so in that particular case there, at that day, God stopped forgiving Saul of his transgressions because Samuel told him, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, I have rejected thee from being king. And when you go look at it, Solomon, or excuse me, Sam, Saul, Samuel, Solomon, and Saul, 
Saul tried to repent or make a show of repentance. And Samuel said, forget it. I'm not, God's not forgiving you anymore and he's not going to talk to you anymore ever again. So that's what made him go to the, uh, the witch at Endor. And I, I believe in the case of Cain, the Bible says Cain was of that wicked one. And God had rejected him and refused to have mercy on him because he slew his brother, spilled his blood. Okay, does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Uh, but anyway, to those who are seeking forgiveness from yesterday or the day before yesterday, God says, I'll give it to you because my mercies are new every morning. It's like you get to start all over again. Okay? And I like that. That's what keeps me going sometimes. So whatever yesterday was, today let's make it different. Amen? Um, yeah, I mentioned this. The last, last one, when they came, Exodus 15, 23, when they came to Marah, uh, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord shewed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. I told you wrong a while ago. I thought that was when Moses struck the rock, but I was wrong. And if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, verse 25. The Lord showed him a tree. That's a tree, isn't it? Cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. And it was the tree, the cross, that healed the waters and healed the people. Amen? I like that. Chapter 7, I'm not going to get into that. Chapter, uh, chapter 9 is the fifth angel. And buddy, we're going to spend a lot of time. In chapter 9. Okay. It wouldn't surprise me if the Lord came back before we were done with chapter 9. Father, I love you. Thank you for this day that you've given us today. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather. Thank you for these that have come into your house to hear your word. And Father, I may not say everything right. I may not understand everything the right way. So, Father, let it be known. That only God is true 100% of the time. Man can be wrong. And Lord, I know I'm wrong about some things. I have to be. I pray, dear God, that you would right the wrongs in my life and the things that I'm, I might teach people so that I do not lead anyone astray. But Father, with these people, Lord, give them a heart like the Bereans who, after they heard the word of God preached and taught, they went to the scriptures to see if these things be true. And Father, I pray, dear God, you put it in the hearts of each one of these, all of those online, Lord, to read and to study their Bible. The days are getting shorter. The days are not, we're, we're not getting farther away from your second coming. We're getting closer to it. We don't know the day or the hour. Lord, that's not for us to know right now. What we should know God, is that we study and know what this book says so that we are not deceived like the world is and help us to pass it along to somebody else along the way. Thank you, God. Bless this word. We pray in Jesus name and all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen.